Hi and welcome along to AFTV. We've got a very special interview today because in the building with us, we have got Mesut Ozil's football agent, um, what I'd call a super agent, because if you're looking after Mesut Ozil, you're a super agent, right? Also, um, he's written this unbelievable book called Deadline. Um, it's Urquhart Sogut, by the way, um, who's with us. And we're going to discuss this book as well, because what's different about this book is it's about football agent, but it's a thriller. A thriller with, um, actually, you were sort of explaining to me um, off air that it's a thriller, but when you actually read the book, yeah. it has a lot of realness <laughs> yeah. about agents and yeah. the world of the football agent. Yeah, definitely. First of all, uh, thank you for having me here, Robbie. Pleasure. I really, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I watched you a lot in the recent years. So now being here, sitting and talking with you, it's my pleasure. You didn't want to get so us cancelled. So, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, yeah, I really look forward for today to catch up and talk with you. So, yeah, the book, it's a project I've started three years ago. I always wanted to share my knowledge. I'm an educator. I teach a lot and uh, my passion is teaching and making someone else's life better through teaching. And I'm a lecturer at university beside being an agent and a lawyer. Wow. And I'm, I'm sh I shared my knowledge of how to become a football agent in a book before. It's called How to Become a Football Agent. But now I wanted to share the inside world of being an agent. I'm 20 years now in this business and I can tell in a fictional way because certain things you can't say, you can't uh, say it because it's uh, difficult to express it. But I could bring the topics in the football world. I'm choosing gray areas, which are not illegal, but ethically, are they correct or not? Are we living in this area of football? A lot of things happening. And for this first book, I choose the area of nepotism in football. What is nepotism? How does nepotism started in football? And how is nepot nepotism embedded in English football, in German football? So I wanna, the reader has a thriller where people, where two agents, rivalry agents, trying to make a deal at Manchester United at the same time. But one agent has an advantage that his brother is the coach of the club. So there's the uh, nepotism issue. And there's a main character in my book as well. It's a journalist. And it's a female journalist. She explains to the reader what is nepotism. So it's a thriller. People die. People trying to make a deal. There's an people agent. People die. People die. People die on the... Uh, so I don't want to tell too much, but people die. And uh, there's an agent cartel behind the scenes operating in the football world. I created a cartel called The Table. It's kind of... Uh, a cartel where every agent wants to join like and this is for the reader kind of to think about could there be really an agent cartel in football world are agents so powerful no it can't be possible right it's just made up or oh, actually some agents are really powerful they control clubs maybe there's a cartel so this is more for the reader to oh. you know like think about is that really possible based but, off of real stories right yeah so the nepotism <laughs> so the nepotism is real it's fact so the journalist explains in certain clubs how nepotism worked out so we had it in certain clubs in the uk and germany that family members working inside the clubs have an agent as their son or their brother working with them together and the reader will see which clubs and which important or famous people in england have done this so from manchester united to arsenal to many other clubs we have nepotism everywhere and the discussion is it's not illegal we can't do anything because law is not saying you can't do it but it's questionable and ethically if it's correct if someone else is better as a player and the father as a coach chooses his own son what will he do as a club you know it's it's unfair sometimes and uh, that's the discussion and i hope the reader will love it you're shedding a, you're shedding a lot, a lot of light on it um agents sometimes and of course you're a football agent they have a bad name sometimes they they get blamed <clears throat> um for a lot of the ills at a football club they're a lot of managers you hear a lot of times describing them as greedy, not interested in the player, how they take money out of the game. So you're kind of saying in this book that actually a lot of that's true. But are you also saying that not everyone's like that? Or Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, unfortunately, the reputation of agents are not good. I mean, there are different reasons for that. First of all, agents are not regulated. Imagine a field of a profession, like I'm a lawyer, so I had to uh, pass the bar, bar exam to become a lawyer. Mm. So I got a certain degree of education and knowledge, which I can deliver to my clients. As an agent, you don't need that. You go today on a website of the FA, pay 500 pound, 
uh, click some boxes and you're registered. You get an intermediary number and you can go tomorrow to Arsenal and sign a player. You've just created about 20 new so, agents out there. <laughs> so I don't know about that, but I mean, it's is so, that easy. Is that easy? It's mad. It's, 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 it's mad, yeah. And so what happened uh, to understand historically, in 2015, FIFA said, we can't deal anymore with agents and the regulations because a lot of deals were done not by agents anyways. 70% deals were done not by agents, just 30%. And FIFA said, we leave it to every country to decide how they want to treat their agents and regulate them. So in England and in Germany, for example, you don't need an exam. You just need to register yourself online and pay a fee. You can start working. Whereas in Italy and France, you need to pass a local exam in their language to start working there. Um, I can act as an agent in this country, but when I go to France and want to make a deal from Paris to Monaco, I can't, I need to work with a French agent. So everyone is doing something different as a chaos right now. And that brought a lot of people inside the business, which are actually not knowledgeable and shouldn't do it, as well as family members a lot. Open the door for them as well to represent their kids or their brothers, like a lot of family members doing that as well, without any knowledge. That's a big issue. And FIFA finally will change it this year. After eight years of uh, losing out, they said we need to bring regulations back to professionalize the business and there must be a barrier to enter to become an agent. It shouldn't be so easy. That's one important thing why agents have a, a bad reputation. But of course they're bad agents as well and greedy agents like bad lawyers and bad tax advisors, like in any mm. profession. But football agents are such an interesting and mystery uh, an area mystery. for people. Yeah, that people always on oh, when there's one bad agent, something bad, it's headline. We don't write about good agents or we don't see anything about them who really work hard and try to get their player under 18, under 19, first team, you re represent them for three, four years, have not enough money, but have to survive. There are so many agents like that working honestly, but it's not interesting for the media. So no one wants to hear about them. So it's more about some big agents doing greedy stuff or dodgy stuff. That's what people like to read. And, and unfortunately, I say these bad agents will remain as long as the clubs are working with them. Yeah. So no one should forget that. Clubs, a lot of clubs and club officials like these so-called bad agents because that's how they can do kickbacks. That's the business. So they Jeez. need them on their club side. Imagine if all the agents were educated and professional, transparent and working strict and without any dodgy deals pockets and we have seen it recently in england certain coaches even national team coaches were doing dodgy stuff right mm. i mean if these people were inside the club wouldn't open the door for these so-called bad agents they will go step by step away but they need them so that's why they're there and is the the change you talked about from fifa the 10 percent cap that's apparently coming in yes so so fifa is planning to cap agents for the first time so they're planning to cap the player's agent <coughs> maximum 3%, max. So you can't earn more than three, could be two, right? Yeah. So 3%. But for the one who's representing the selling club, FIFA is saying can earn up to 10%. Again, it doesn't make sense because the ones who are representing clubs are also considered as player agents. We are under the same umbrella, but we're doing two different professions. It's like someone is, someone is an electrician and someone is doing, I don't know, uh, repairs cars, for example, or doing something totally, or as a waiter. But you treat them in the same pocket in the same way, whereas oh, most of the money goes to so-called club agents. They don't represent, most of them don't represent even players ever. You never would know them, but they're on the club side and they are considered to receive 10% of the transfer fee for not doing much, just bringing parties together, phone calls. I broke the deal, with other words. Whereas they treat the player agent, so it should have been the other way around yeah, yeah. Mm. for someone who looks really sixty and time and energy, but that's lobbyism. Mm. Because on the club side, you have European Club Association and all them, they are sitting with FIFA and UEFA Fifth Pro on one table and decide together. Whereas agents, another big problem, we are not stakeholders. They decide about us rather than with us. And that's a huge problem because they don't know how it looks inside. They can look just from outside, see, see one, two big agents making 50 million, 40 million. They say, well, that's too much money, 3%. But that's just 0.05% of the agents. You're actually hitting with that. The young agents, the new starting agents trying to break through and representing, imagine a League 2 player, League 1 player. You can't survive at 3%. You can't even start becoming an agent. It's impossible. That's why actually that will open more doors for, again, side agreements, <coughs> unfortunately. Yeah. Listen, um... We're going to talk a lot more about this book later on, right? But I want to get into a couple of other questions, right? 
The first one I want to start with, and I know Turkish has got a load of questions to throw at you as well, right, is how do you become the agent of one of the most famous, biggest players in the world of football, which is Mesut Ozil? I mean, his social media following. He's, he's a brand himself. So you're, you're, you're looking after a brand that you're, is at a football club. That is what it's like. I mean... How, do you, how did you become his agent? I mean, it's an, it's an interesting story that I got asked the question a lot, actually. How did I end up representing Mesut Ozil? And the, the real answer or the truth is I never wanted to become an agent in first place. I just want to become a professor at university. I always wanted to teach. Mm. And still, I want to become a professor and I'm still working for that. So I've done my master's, I've done my doctor in law. So I, my academic career was going on and I was really happy. And I specialized myself in sports law and sports management very early while I was studying and did an intern in football agencies to learn the legal side more about contracts. That was in 2001, more than 20 years ago. I entered that business on a legal side more and to develop myself, to learn the practical side but become more the teacher at university who teaches contracts and uh, sponsorship deals, marketing deals. I wanted to be an expert in that field. So while I was doing that, I started also teaching people inside the business, football business, because parents are started asking me, how do we do this boot deal? Uh, I got a scholarship contract for my son, Erkut. Can you have a look? Can you have a look on that? That's how I got approached by Mesut Özil's family and helping them actually by teaching them and helping them with contracts. How old was Özil at this point? Do you remember or...? Sorry? How old was Ozil at this point? Do you remember? He was playing Real Madrid. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. He was so Real Madrid on his second year. By yeah. a player at Real yes. Madrid. Yeah. That. I mean, by the, by the family at the time, by his father. Yeah. So I was actually in London or actually in Oxford mm. that day when I got a phone call. I was researching for my future PhD in Oxford University in the library, law library, when I got a phone call and uh, from the dad directly and he said look i've seen you're like a young lawyer and you're helping others with contracts and would you mind to come to dusseldorf into our office and help us and teach us well just once a month yeah. so i said yeah i can do that it's just like i'm a student you know you have to pay my hotel mm. and flight <clears throat> I, I, I can't pay that mm. right i'm a student i'm working as a waiter like at the same time i'm teaching people languages so that's how i stay above you know like mm. i'm still a student <clears> they <throat> said, yeah, no, it's no problem. So I went there for six times and I was doing my master's in Turkey. I was teaching at the same time, Özil and his uh, brother, father, everyone, and helping them with contracts. They said to me, we would like to have you as a lawyer in the company here in Germany. I finished my master's. I said, I'm about to start my PhD. Like I committed to university. I can't be a full-time lawyer for him. Okay, you go to Madrid and talk. So I've been to Madrid and I'm a mess there. I said, yeah, my father said, you'll become the lawyer now. I said, Yes, but I can't work full time, you know, I'm just about to start my PhD. I explained them what I want to become. I want to be a professor and hopefully at Harvard. That's my goal. I told them my dream. Your dream might be here, Real Madrid. My, my dream is really to be there one day. And then he laughed and said, and he liked it. He liked the, the way I was honest. And I said, okay, let's do half, half. Half you're my lawyer and half you're a student, literally. That was an agreement. And mm. we shaked hands and I started working. And... Another year just passed and Mesut came to Arsenal. And just after the move to Arsenal, I got, uh, I, I, I was his lawyer at the deal. So I represented him as a lawyer and done the contracts and everything. So after that, the family invited me again and Mesut, it was like he was for national team in Germany actually, in Dusseldorf in a hotel. And I went there without knowing anything. They said, look, we, we made a decision here as a family. You take over now, you're the agent. And I'm thinking to, tomorrow if I'm sitting in the library, I need to do my PhD research. And I'm th I don't think at all about that. I'm thinking, how will I manage they now? Wrestled, yeah. Yes, I'm like, and then, and the first thing I said, yes, but I can't do it full time. And then everyone was laughing again, you know. I said, I have still a two and a half years of PhD. If you agree on that, that I can do that. And I'm not always available, but I can work at weekends overnight. I don't mind. I'm a workaholic. I like, I like working and everything. And then yeah, we agreed on that. So I was, a, I was his agent when he was at Arsenal. So I was sometimes coming to a game at the weekend. But in the week, then I was a student in the library and drinking this wow. coffee you can't even drink, you know? Like, <laughs> and people say, what are you doing here? You should be there now. I say, yeah, but man, I need to finish my PhD. Yeah, Love so I was that. always like that. I always had my own goals. And yeah, I learned so much then. Then I moved to London. So I live here a couple of years now. So since 2015, 14, 15, I live here. And I learned so much through Mesut and I'm really thankful 
he opened me so many doors yeah uh, because of him uh, i met so many people in this industry and so many new doors open and experience so i learned from the top to the bottom kind of you understand a lot of people mm. work like for me was like difficult like and then people say hey you should start representing more players you have Ozzy. i say I, I can't i'm doing my phd mm. and i need to look after him mm. he's a big brand as you said Massive. so many calling for interviews so many marketing sponsorship club things i mean it doesn't end it's like a comp you look after a company who then builds other companies in cosmetic in coffee in this in uh, in his own branding so you look after in, uh, like a holding yeah. so it's a lot of work that's why i said looking after method is like looking after 30 average premier league player in terms of time 30, you'd say yes looking on so looking after method Ozil will be like looking after 30 average average premier yes, league like players. a like a standard average player not a wow. star because because wow. uh, he's a global brand right a lot of players in the premier league don't leave the premier league if they're english english they stay they're local brand mm -hmm. if they are a brand so for us it was like uh, creating a brand was my uh, was was my biggest mission in 2014 when he won the world cup i said okay that's the time so next stage i need to go to us and i met a designer in america and i asked him look i have a football player won the world cup the fa cup played Real Madrid, Germany, and et cetera, et cetera. So how can we create a brand out of him and then license that brand later? So like a three step. And then, yeah, we, then we started a process which took like over a year until the M10 brand was out. Mm. But we couldn't use the M10 brand because he was with Adidas. Oh, okay. So you might, maybe you remember the time when it was news, Adidas dumped Mesut Ozil and stuff. Yeah. It wasn't dumped, the contract ran out. And because the contract, we were waiting for it that it runs out so we can push our own brand. Because yeah. if you sign a boot deal, Robbie, you don't sign a boot deal. Yeah. You commit to everything, clothing, sneakers, T-shirts, you are fully, you yeah. can't do your own thing, right? Or you might have some clothes in it, which allows you a little bit on your own branding, but they want, they want to sell sneakers. They don't want to sell boots. That, that's what they actually sign football players, right? Oh, wow. So. So, so when, when uh, 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 and I know all about these boot deals with my son, if you're watching, right? <laughs> right? Because, you know what I mean, he, he wants every boot that comes out. But, um, but you're saying that they, they don't really make the money specifically off the boots. They no. make it more off the trainers. Yeah, yeah, sneakers. yeah, yeah. Sneakers, sneakers. It's a, yeah. it's, it's a big sneakers business. So you can go and check like income, Adidas, Nike. You can go online, Google it. You'll find all the information about that. It's public. And you see that the biggest income for them, the boot is the entry for them to use the athlete. It's mm. like, you know, of course the athlete needs to wear it and they sell it, but the big money is with sneakers. That's what players wear as well, right? Mm. But the biggest issue with uh, boot deals is not only boot, is, as what I said, it's so much more, even headphones and stuff. So that contract you sign bound you for years not to actually build your own brand. So yeah. that's the thing, a football player, I always say it's a football player is big enough and has a huge reach on social media, on marketing, should create his own brand. What's his reach, what is his reach on social media? Over 80 million. 80 million? Yeah, yeah it's big. It's, it's that's, bigger than, that's bigger than, I'd say that'd be bigger than the majority of football clubs then. Yeah, a lot, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. Apart from, you know, your obvious from the, huge the big clubs, ones, Real Madrid and Barcelona, they have big, much more, but right, 80 other than, million? Yes. If you put all together, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all of them, YouTube channel, yeah. Did that annoy you? And it could you... be more, you know? Because he is a very, Mesut is a very... Yeah, he's very reserved. I mean, you don't see him on Insta story much. You don't really see him on social media a hell of a lot. So he, he could have a much bigger fan. Yeah, definitely. Mesut is, uh, in terms of like these things, he's very shy as well. Like people, if, if he doesn't know people as well, he's first very reserved and quiet. But if he's then in a room where he gets, you know, warm up and likes people, then he is the entertainer. Okay. The people doesn't know as well. He well, would usually make the jokes and he will run the show. Yeah. But generally in the beginning, he's very reserved and he, he's not spending much time, as you said, on social media, makes Insta stories or so. If he would be more on social, we'd more, definitely more than 100 million easily. But, yeah. but we, we started a strategy early with him to build a social media appearance and work with a professional team. Uh, in, in Germany, still with the same team in Munich, I said, look, we have a football player here and he's professional, he's working, uh, playing on that level, so I need a professional team in social media, marketing and PR, I'm not just doing it on the side. Yeah. If you want to generate income for the future, generate, because having a huge followership on uh, social media means for a player the opportunity to earn as well more money on deals. Yeah. Because that's what the clubs uses, that's what the sponsors want, Adidas, Nike, whatever, whoever you work with, Mercedes, Benz, they would say, oh, how much follower do you have? 
and you can exactly break it down in numbers and fans and countries and regions and that's value data is value and if the player has that data that value it's good for him yeah yeah i mean mm. when you when you look at his following and and um, some of the moments that happen across his arsenal career and the reactions to it i mean um a few of those moments one being when he you know stuck up for the uyghur muslim population in xinjiang um, another being when he came out against the German FA when he left the German national team and he spoke yeah. of racism and whatnot. Yeah. And another being the COVID pay cut. So as, as his lawyer slash agent over that time, um, how did you react to those and how did Arsenal react to it? Because over that time, it did feel like the player versus club situation was arising for us fans yeah but it might be different inside yeah out. i mean for the media it was the best thing like i guess oh, play against uh, uh club and it, it wasn't really like that it was like i mean as you as you mentioned with the uyghur muslims so mesut when I, I remember the day when he sent me a message and i was in germany actually in frankfurt and i was about to get onto a plane and then he said to me i want to do something about this issue uh, when you land back in London, we want to bring out something soon. Mm -hmm. Like work already, like I want to phrase this, 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 because he watched certain things online yeah. and yeah. seen and he seen it's proven now, it's true. So I want to do something there. And I'm, and I'm just about to <laughs> going to the plane, I'm saying like, well, are, are you sure? Like, uh, like well, you want to do it? Yeah, yeah, no, I want to do it. And then, okay, I talk to you when I land. Let's just leave it for now. So I was in this plane from Frankfurt to London one hour and I was thinking like about the advantages and disadvantages of doing something like because that. Because you're not saying it's a bad thing to do. What you're, the way I'm taking what you're saying here is how it's perceived outside. Yeah, I mean, look. The as fallout. A, as you're, a, you're, yes, you're, you're looking at what the fallout's going to be. Yeah, you're an athlete, you know, and sometimes athletes are athletes. And it's when an athlete starts getting out of that circle and becoming more than an athlete and talking like a Muhammad Ali. Legend, so, legend. I mean, I always compare like Mohamed Ali to Michael Jordan. They're two great athletes, mm -hmm. yeah. one in basketball, one in boxing. And we will remember, but we will probably remember Mohamed Ali more than Michael Jordan because... Who he was. Because his personality off the pitch, off the basket, uh, off the boxing field. Yeah. You know, when he was talking about things like issues for the people. Yeah. Whereas Michael Jordan was saying, Republicans buying sneakers too. So he wanted to suit all sides. So there are these two kind of players, some players, football players, they keep quiet during their career. Even they believe something is happening and they should talk. They don't want to talk because they don't want that to affect their career with sponsors, with the club, with anything. They yeah. just rather keep quiet. And there are this type of footballers like Mohamed Ali or like Mesut Ozil who says, if I'm not talking now, then it's too late. Mm -hmm. It's something is happening there. I'm not waiting till my career is over. What does that bring like? Yeah. So that's this kind of, and they don't see themselves in the front. They see, they do something for others to raise the voice. And he said, so I landed and talked and I called him, look, Mezzo, this, this will happen. Sponsors in China, this region, or sponsors even related to China, you will lose. It can affect A, B, C. I give him the whole list. Yeah. And uh, the advantage is like, you do what you want, right? What you desire to do. Yeah. You, want, you have an opinion you want to share. If it makes you feel good and everything so it's your decision but i tell you like the impact it will have mm. i need to explain it to you as your lawyer mm -hmm. and as your agent and he was from clear from minute one he would never change his opinion on that and i could never or no one could he said i do this and i stay and i stay behind my opinion and i want to share this because i think these people need my voice and that's it and that's how we put it out and of course, when a player, I have players who wouldn't do it and I have players who would do it and I respect both at the same way because it's different parameters for some players than for another. Mesut is a huge player, huge global reach, yeah. you know. If you say something, it's news. So, whereas for someone else, it's not the same and they, wanna, they don't want to talk about these things. But you have to respect both kind of players in the same way. Yeah. And yes, and Mesut is so, and after he's done it, of course, I need to defend him to the end. It's my player, it's my mm -hmm. client. Whatever happens, I'm there. And that's the time when you as an agent come out and stick with your player and not with someone else and want to suit someone and say, look, it's my player. He took, that's his opinion. You might like it or not, but I'm behind him until the end. And, yeah. that, and that's my job as his agent to defend him there. And it was an easy time for us and for me as well. Of course, I got a lot of phone calls and say like, hey, are you guys crazy? What are you doing and everything, right? <laughs> it's like, and I'm saying, look, this is what the player wants to do, like, and this is his opinion, and he has his opinion, and he wants to share his opinion. And you can see after that, a lot more things happen like that. 
yeah. more players coming out and talking about issues in politics. You have seen Rashford and mm. Sterling. It went more and more, right? It, it's become more acceptable now than like when Mesut was done it yeah. at the time. Because, yeah, I mean, uh, I learned a lot. Let's yeah. say like that. A <laughs> <laughs> lot I of heat. You, you lot just, of heat. <laughs> you see, like, you learn by doing, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think I've learned with Mesut so many things, man. All the, all, everything you can learn, I think I learned with him. Sometimes it takes someone to break down a barrier. And when that someone is massive and the scale of Mesut Ozu. Listen, um, my opinion of Mesut Ozu on the pitch for Arsenal differs to yeah. Mesut Ozu off the pitch. And, and those kind of things, you know, I respect it. In terms yeah. of icons, for me, Mohamed Ali is yeah. the icon. He yes. is the one that I yes. look at. Yeah. Yes. And, I, and, I, and I ask why no one else has been like that to that yes. extent yes. for the black community Muslim community yes. communities he cared an awful lot oh, about yeah, yeah. he put his own career and reputation on the line for it you mentioned preempting Mesut Ozu about the reactions to what he was about to release um, sponsorships and China and, and whatnot. what about Arsenal's reaction because a few days later they distanced themselves from it yeah um, I mean uh, um, you're right like uh, Arsenal kind of they didn't stay quiet in that sense. They just, they even distanced themselves from the players' uh, things. I wasn't expecting that personally. You don't have to comment on that, which is the club's position, but you don't also have to distance from yourself, from your player, which is talking about an issue which is like real in terms of that. You don't have to say, we're not with you, kind of. We don't, we distance ourselves. I think, but you know, it's, it, it's not Arsenal. There are people working inside clubs, you know. Arsenal is a big club, it's uh, had a big tradition and I've been eight, seven, eight years to uh, Emirates and uh, it's fantastic, you know, like and the fans and everything, it's unbelievable. So it's a big club, big, yeah. big club. It's probably the biggest club in London, right, for me. Like if I see from history and tradition, yeah, yeah. right, other clubs have my, more money and spending on players, but you are big as a traditional way, history, and that's yeah, Arsenal natural. and Manchester United in North, you have that. Man City will be never Manchester United because yeah. Manchester United history. You understand what I mean? Mm, yeah, yeah. They built history like with, with uh, working hard, not yeah. with money. Natural. Naturally, naturally history. Mm. And that's Arsenal. And, and certain people working inside this club, representing the club, can make deci uh, decisions which reflects badly on a club. Yeah, yeah. That doesn't mean the club is, do you understand? Yeah, yeah. I separate all these institutions from the club. You know, you have the studio, someone, some of your colleagues may make a mistake which wasn't meant to be. It's not from you or not from Arsenal Fan TV. You understand? But it can reflect to you as well in that moment mm. because someone representing you making a mistake. Yeah. And mm -hmm. we say it's Arsenal Fan TV, but it wasn't, you know, it shouldn't be like that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it's, uh, as I said, it's a club's decision and I respect Mesut and me. We respect, of course, every decision is taken by the club. We can't do anything, you know? And we were not expecting backing or so either. Yeah. We were expecting nothing in the end like to do, you know, not we, we are with you or without you. Yeah. It's just being silent. It's the player's uh, opinion to do it. But you don't distance from your player in a in that uh, such a thing. You know, you can distance yourself from a player in a normal political thing in a parliament, in my personal opinion, yeah. but not in an issue where it's really it's proven. That was just before COVID times, I believe. Um, and shortly into COVID, well, maybe not shortly, but a while into COVID, um, obviously the impact mm. across people, businesses and so on. Um, Arsenal requested that players take a pay cut. And we spoke about this offer. And, and you know, you mentioned how Mesut Ozu asked the club um, for a certain set of questions to be answered um, before he committed to that. Yeah. And regardless of not committing to it, he doubled up on efforts outside of, of yeah. the club and, and with his own wages and money yeah. to, to make up for that. Yeah, definitely. I mean, with, with Mesut, I'm lucky having a, a working uh, for a player like him who, so sh uh, who shares so much. So from the first moment I worked with him, like whenever I asked him for a charitable project, when I was approached, he never said no. It's like unbelievable because yeah. he's, he grew up like that in a very poor background. Like mom, dad going working, cleaning, like really like he not like not a very good, uh, like financially struggling background, yeah. of course. And football was the exit for that, right? And Mesut's mom left something in the house here in London. So when she came, like when you got transferred, she came and left something in the kitchen. She wrote with her own hand and put it there so you can see it every day. And it says, you, 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 my son, you got gifted by God, right? And God gave you something which your other brothers and sisters don't have. And other people might not have either. But he gave you that, what you have, with a reason. So if you're not sharing with people in need what you have, you are not my son remember this every day so this boy has this mentality of sharing 
and everything he has he wants to give to others and make opportunities in sharing and projects so we used our arsenal emirates uh, at the emirates our box every home game he said we have a 15 seater box he had keep five seats for uh, kids with cancer projects every home game he said don't touch these seats work with we work with different charities in london and i had to always take care of them bring them upstairs sometimes you know with um and any uh, a lot of kids also last stage of cancer yeah so he started relationship with these kids and some died on the way you know he mm -hmm. built a proper relationship with some of them so he was always giving and in that time when this happened with the salary cut he said as well he asked me where's the money going right as a player he asked me like when we get the salary cut what's happening and we as agents and lawyers were not involved in the process as well it was with the players directly like and they were chatting about that on on their whatsapp group and everything we got we came into the game last day when Meza didn't say yes or no to anything right and i know i said very very straightforward i said to the guys they're not working in the club anymore i said Meza wants to guarantee that the money is used for the people inside the club that you will not fire anyone we want has written no one will get fired because that was the thing we were talking. Fair. You will get a fair, uh, you you'll get a salary cut because we don't want to fire anyone. Yeah. That was one of the topics, yeah, right? And uh, as well as management needs to have a salary cut and ownership, everything. So there was a list, and Mezzo said, "If that happens, I'm happy to give more." That more, was my, more than the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because I think I'm at a, the time they, it was fifteen percent. Yeah, he said I can give thirty. I don't mind. It's not, thirty. Yes, it's so not, he's looking to he, he was looking to yeah, double, but unless it's proven and it's signed where and, it's going and, and legally where the money is going and no one is getting fired because he he said like i don't want anyone i want my money to be used to secure people's work otherwise he can do it outside so himself if, yeah if i'm not mm. getting the proven i do my own my own charity which is going on anyway in north mm. london food projects for years so we just put the money actually which he, he said look so arsenal didn't give gave that to us so it was also it was like i got contacted one day before and uh, it was not there and we said okay it's clear for us take that money you you have access like in terms of that amount of money goes to projects grow the projects ramadan projects this project we just build up on it yeah and uh, he still give money back but to the community he felt where it's needed in that time because mm. he wasn't sure where the money is going there so he needed the assurance it was the only thing what he wanted to and, but of course, in the media and everything, Mesut is greedy, he's not getting a salary cut. But think about it. The Players Association in England said, don't take a salary cut. That was the... Plus, every captain of the Premier League team said, no salary cuts, don't accept it in, the, in your clubs. So it was a common agreement. The only club where that happened was Arsenal. Every other club did a deferral. That was as well what the Premier League captains and as well the Players Association said. You only accept the deferral and decide three months later if the money is really needed to get a salary cut. That was the deal. But the only club who have done it this way was Arsenal. You know, um, in terms of what Messi Ozil done in terms of the questions off the back of being asked for a pay cut, um, was those questions posed because he had doubts about these certain people within Arsenal and, and their true intentions? No, I don't think he had any doubts or so. He just wanted to have it written. You know, it's like having a contract. When you do a deal with someone, you should, you should have a contract. It's just written and it's guaranteed. And I mean, we have seen after two months, they fired 55 people, didn't they? Yeah. So, so he said to me, look, I knew this will happen. Well, right. Gunasaurus Gunasor so, was one and he came yeah. out and said that. That, that was know. later on. That yeah, was yeah, later yeah, on. Yeah. That was it. So for him, like, look, I have to respect his decision there as well. He, he wants to know where his money goes if he's giving it. If it goes to buy another player, he doesn't want to do it. If the money goes to really to secure workplace, then he wants to do it. Yeah. 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 I mean, Mr. Ozil, you know, that, that was a bit of a sad time because that was kind of the beginning of the end. I want to talk about those, some of the, the great moments, because I always remember when he first signed for us. We, we sort of started the channel. Mm. We'd only been about a year in. And I'll never forget, um, we, it was on transfer deadline day. I was down the stadium. We were filming. And when it was announced that Mesut Ozil is signing for Arsenal, and he probably has never been aware of this, but there was this spontaneous eruption some fans had gathered down there already. Mm. They went wild. And then literally all the communities around Islington came out 
onto the street. It was just a spontaneously came out onto the street and it was this massive celebration. You know where the roundabout is yeah, in front yeah, of yeah. The, uh, the Emirates? Yes. That was completely packed with people, hundreds and hundreds of people. Mm. No cars could get through. The police were coming and saying, guys, can you clear the road? Everyone was like, no. Wow. Well, and fans were like, this is it now. Mm. This is the moment we finally signed a world-class player. Because remember, for a while, we hadn't yeah, signed anybody. It's not like we were turning a corner. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, it was a real coup to bring him in yeah. for Real Madrid. And I think the fans absolutely loved and adored mm. Mesut Ozil. Yeah. I know it kind of went a bit sour yeah. towards the end but yeah. and you know for me when I used to watch him play at Arsenal I don't think I've ever seen you know I, I look at two there's two players that I always look at and think three players I've looked at and say who the most skillful but the two with Henri in it but I kind of yeah. always look and I say Ozil or Burkham yeah. those two just had sublime skill yeah. he just did things that yeah. with the ball that were just so Unbelievable, you know. Magical what I mean, at times, he was just yeah. magical, natural yeah. player. I mean, did he? Is, is he? Uh, I mean, I, I remember him always with the yard on his yard yeah, and yeah, things yeah. like that. Did he really realize um, how much the fans really loved yeah. him? And and I think you could see that, like, because there were opportunities to go to other Premier League clubs as well while the contract oh, yeah. was going to the ends. Of course, there's some interest, and and he was like, "I'm a gunner. Like, I could never ever play for another Premier League team." He was like one sentence and done. It was never again a topic for him, even to go and discuss and talk with another club. It was like, I'm not that kind of a player. I go uh, to this Premier League club and the next one because he built the identity. Like he yeah. is Arsenal. You know, mm. he's a part of, and especially when they were singing this song for him, we've got a mm. field. I mean, yeah. even if I was in the stadium, it, it's, it's so nice. Like, yeah. It's unbelievable. And when you've done these good plays, like when a great game, Mezzo played amazingly, scored or assisted, they won a big game, let's say against Man United or so, and he's coming off. And then yeah. the fans all singing that. I mean, it's a special moment. And, and there is no other team in the world where he played, he had a song. Okay. Yeah. So for Arsenal, he always feels a different thing. Like it was a, that's why he wanted to remain until the end. You know, he was like, he's like family to him. Yeah. I remember the time as well. I, the, the news first broke on Sunday night. I was at a friend's house and on the screen, and I'm with a few Man United friends and whatnot. Like Robbie said, we hadn't <laughs> signed a big player. We hadn't signed a world-class yeah. superstar like that ever. And, you know, we was just a top four candidate at the time. It broke. Mesut Oz is obviously, I'm Turkish. So I'm looking at, okay, he chose to um, yeah. pick Germany, but a Turkish man, Turkish name, Muslim, coming into Arsenal, I was over the moon. Yeah. For years, I was buying, let's call them unofficial jerseys. When Mr. Ozil came, my friend on Monday, he, he was driving down Stoke Newington and I said, stop. And I just got out of the car, I said, I'm going to Arsenal shop, I'll be back. Mm -hmm. Went to the shop, I said, Ozil 11. They was like, he hasn't signed yet. And I said, he's <laughs> signing, he's signing. Put Ozil 11 on yeah. that shirt and I've got yeah. it till, till today. So that shows how much, you know, mm. it meant to us fans, yeah. him coming in. And at times, don't get me wrong, Arsenal let him down by not adequately um, supporting him with a, with a cast around, mm. maybe a defensive mid or a striker with pace and so mm. on. And, and I think that was part of why... He had Santi for a while, he loved him. Well, I was going to ask you who his favourite player was. I think probably one of the most favourite was Santi Cazola. Yeah. I mean, yeah. So mm. Santi's ability, like, to read the game. Yeah. Mesut is a smart player, intelligent player. Mesut reads a game. You could see he's always looking like... He loves to play as well with intelligent players who can, you know, if, he's, if you're number 10, the one behind you and the one in front of you, Important. you're a good striker mm -hmm. mm. and uh, a good number six who kind of cleans it up and sees you and plays you the ball that you can give the final pass. So Mesut is a very creative player. So he needs that one. And Santi is very smart, very intelligent and very technique. And that suited Mesut a lot to have him behind him. That was the... But when Santi left, you could see it went, it wasn't the same anymore. Yeah, yeah. You could see right. right away, it, it changed. And as, as well, for a player like Mesut, I think there's no number 10s anymore. Mm. Mm, it's changed, isn't number it? Number 10s are made wingers now. Yeah. So, and this is also, it, the game is not that beautiful anymore, in, in my personal opinion. So now it's like quick from the wing, quick pass, Robotic goal. now. It's yeah. like, yeah, it's like always mm. over the wings, fast, quick, ball. It's like, but in the past, you were wa watching uh, Totti, right? Mm -hmm. When Totti, I watched him once in Madrid, in Bernabeu. Yeah. Uh, Real Madrid was playing Ars Roma and Totti came on, right? And the whole stadium mm -hmm. came up. Just applaud him because even the Real Madrid fans, he was an artist. Mm -hmm. you, will, you like to watch even how he touches the ball, how he gets. So it was, it was nice to watch these players. Mm. But they are getting less and less. We don't have that anymore. Many that, artists, yeah. So this 10 years ago, there was always a number 10 in the team. 
today it doesn't exist anymore. Who's playing with the number 10? It's just a number now. Yeah, it's, it's just a number yeah. now, but it was this special Zidane, it was the Tottis, the Baggios, like the, the, the number 10 is, is gone now. It's now mm. the wingers, like the yeah. ones. I, I, I love this partnership with Alexis. Yeah, when, it was it, also when, he, when unique, he played with yeah. Alexis, that, that was a great partnership. Yeah, also and, fantastic. And they player. bought success, you know what I mean? Yes, yes. Trophies, you know. Oh, yeah. Same, same. Alexis is also that level player, yeah, yeah. you know, you can see right away. And if you put that level of player, more of them in one team, then you have huge success. You win a league. So actually, as a good team, a fantastic team, you need two very good players on every position. Like as a Man City has. Yeah. They can bring out a winger, the next winger has the same quality. <laughs> Doesn't make a difference who plays, right? You look at their bench and see all of them are like yeah. top, top, top. Mm. So, and if you build a team with like world-class players, you need like more than two. You yeah. can't win the league with Alexis and Mesut. It's impossible. You need four more like this in defenders, you know, it's number six. Mm. If you have four, five, six of them, then you build a proper team and smart, good players and high profile players. You know, it's a, it's a, it makes a difference, huge. We've talked about a few of the highs and a few of the lows, um, but yourself, Erkuta and Mesut, obviously you're very closely connected. Um, your favorite Arsenal moment, Mesut's favorite Arsenal moment, um, based off of what you know. Yeah, I, th I think uh, the first FA Cup win was special because Arsenal hasn't won anything for a long time. Yeah, I remember yeah. mm. it was like, we, we need to win it. You know, you know, it wasn't that bad like Tottenham, let's say. Oh, right? It can never be, it can never be that bad. <laughs> <laughs> An empty trophy for always. But it was like, it was like, I could feel like as, a, as someone who's going to the stadium, the fans are really like, we need this, you know, we need to f win a cup, yeah. right? And when the FA Cup was there, it was big. Like they were on this bus traveling through. Like, it was huge. And for mm. Mesut as well, it was like, a special moment in the first year coming to Arsenal and help them to win a cup. Yeah. It's a, it's a, you know, it's a statement. And then from there, he goes to Brazil and wins the World Cup. Mm. So that year was special, like in winning like the FA Cup, the World Cup, uh, the, starting the M10 brand. Yeah. Everything mm. started in that year, literally. It was a special. I'm, th I'm thinking to myself, he's got to be, a, you, you know what, you see Mesut Ozil, you see the way he plays. Um, you see the, the, what you said there, he can be quite reserved and that, but he's got to be a mentally tough guy. I mean, some of the stuff, you yeah. know, the highs and the lows he's had, the stuff uh, that he went through with Germany, you yeah. know what I mean? That, that was, you know, he went from being like their main guy, all oh, every season, player of the year, yeah. to them just dropping him. He ain't even yeah, German yeah, no more. Yeah, he, <laughs> exactly. There was he's all Turkish that. now, not yeah, German yeah, anymore. Yeah, you know what I mean? He, the, the Arsenal went from being the star player, the go-to guy to... You know the way it ended. You know, he, but he, he, you know, he's he's still doing his thing. He's gone on. He's at Fenerbahce now. He, he's a mentally. T he's got to be a mentally yeah. tough guy, hasn't he? Yeah. I mean, we just watching from outside. You know, these players. Some of them have probably depression. You know, mm. and a lot of other mental issues which they don't know they have it. Like mm. a lot of players probably playing football with mental issues. Yeah. Which they don't know yet, but it comes out later on. Mm -hmm. And uh, because the pressure is very high. Yes, they earn a lot of money, but. It's every two, three games, sometimes a game on that level. The fans, the family members, teammates, the pressure, media. It's, it's not easy. It's a mental game now, more or less, right? You need to be mentally very strong as a football player. So when I work with my young players, I prepare them mentally yeah. to get ready for that rather than physically, right? Mm. It's Don't a watch no AFTV. Sorry? You say to him, don't watch no AFTV after the game <laughs> unless you play well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, to be honest, we watched some of them. And when the, when the comments was bad, I was like closing them down. Like, Let's watch the next video. <laughs> yeah. but, but, you, but you and Messi did watch and like, yeah, in it was terms funny, of AFTV man. and Look, giving fans a voice. Yeah, it's, it's, it's funny and it's the voice of the fans yeah. outside the stadium. And right away, the emotional fans, you know, mm. when you had a bad loss to get someone. In, <laughs> sorry, and sorry, the fans I want to say like, sorry now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, Sorry. he's a guilty one. <laughs> but you know what? It's being Turkish, seeing him come in and then seeing how it ended. I don't put it all on Ozil yeah. and I put a majority of it on the club. Mm. But it was a sad ending to what I thought at the time was going to be yeah. a beautiful story. And like yeah. I said, being Turkish and being connected in that way too. Arsenal have never had a, well, never had a Turkish player in the first team like that. So, you know, the, the raw, I'm glad you understand when you go to a game and you come out and you, you're interviewed, the raw emotion is still there. Yeah, yeah, if you yeah, interview yeah. me the next day, 24 hours oh, after, yeah, yeah. it'd be a lot calmer, yeah, yeah. articulated. We're all so. like that. Mm. After a game, it's emotion, but you want the emotion on a, on a TV. Mm. You yeah. don't want it. It's all from love. It's all from love. <laughs> yeah. It's all we just, yeah. you know, and, and, it, and you know what? It's the other way when we, when we do well. 
you know, um, you know, it's the it's completely it's round completely the other way. way. You know yeah, I mean? yeah. You know yeah. I mean? See, so he's the best. He's world class. <laughs> and we knew it. two weeks later he's like he's not running. What is he doing? Like, I don't see, wait, yeah. like two weeks ago he was the main guy. Like, how does it change so quickly? He's watched my interviews. He's, yeah. <laughs> he's so lazy. He's not. Re he's lazy. He's not running. And then I'm checking the stats. He's running a lot actually. Yeah, that year when him and Sanchez's contract was running out, the main argument was Ozil doesn't run much. But if you look at that season in 2018. 18, up until that moment, Ozil was running more than Sanchez. So there was mm. yeah, there was things yeah. there that, like you said, the media like to make Sometimes you things see certain things not... Like, Mesut has a different style of running and playing and a lot of things you don't see. Yeah. But Both he's opening... Right? Yeah, he's opening uh, the room a lot Space. for other players, spaces in the game. And uh, when I talk to his under-19 coach, he's still the under-19 coach of Schalke, Norbert Elgert. Yeah. He's probably the best youth coach in the world, in my personal opinion, right? If not... Yeah, I mean, there are but others, but... He created professional player so many than no one else. <coughs> so they were like Leroy Sané and yeah. Mezzo, Draxler, mm. Neuer, Bayern Munich. They went all through his hands. So he's a massive Draxler. He's a massive coach. And I said, what was different with Mezzo than others? He's, he's so intelligent. He's reading the game. So he's like always up. Like yeah. he's, he's like, he's smart, very intelligent on the pitch. He could read the game. Like he knew where to run to make space. He knew how to take the ball and turn the body. So he was making these predictions and everything up front. Yeah. Very smart. He could read the game. He said that mm. was his biggest ability. Mesut is someone so smart. He needs to have players smart as well around him. He's so smart on the pitch. Like, I know he loved London. And, but was he put off that time when the robbery... The attempted robbery on him that time when again another huge story about yeah, that. There's so many stories. <laughs> <laughs> Can we do part two and part three? Please? Yeah, you have a book on him as well. Yeah, yeah. And, and don't forget about the book, by the way. <laughs> We're coming back to the We're book in a second, don't book. worry. That's why I'm here. Actually. <laughs> well, yeah. he's, he's, he's just had an incident packed time yeah. here, eh? because there was that incident as well, yeah, wasn't it? It was a lot of things going uh, back to back. Yeah. Back mm. to back, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was. Uh, it was a difficult situation because of um, family. You know, <coughs> when you live alone and so, it's still fine. But if you have wife and stuff, mm. you, you, you're different. You care about wife, uh, wife's pregnant and everything. So it was, was not easy that time. And, but, you know, this happens in London a lot. Like, it was mm. like, at the time, it was in the media. But then I, I went and checked the data. Like, how many, how often this happens? It's a lot. Like, it's yeah. massive. Like, we just don't hear it. Because it mm. happened to a football player. Yeah. It was in the news. Uh, yeah. Other than that, it happens every day. Like, I mean, we knew it, like, and yeah, but it was a very, uh, very strange situation for him, right? To live it and Seat as well. And Seat came out and starting fighting. Yeah, it was yeah, like, yeah. It's like, yeah. Bodyguard. Yes, it was the <laughs> bodyguard. But now, yeah, that's, that, that, that's, that's why he came to Arsenal. Oh, is he it? Said, we now, we know. As a body now it's out. <laughs> now it's the it's only out. reason he was signed. That was an expensive bodyguard, you know. Very he was expensive a free bodyguard. agent. They didn't yeah, need but to the pay. wages, he was like, yeah, let me be a bodyguard for that money. Listen, right? <laughs> Mesut Ozil says about your book, he says, such an exciting read. I love this book. Really opens up your eyes to the dark side of football. Mesut Ozil says that yeah. of the book, right? And just, you know, going back to the book at the moment, which I can't wait to read, um, Deadline. Um, you know, revealing all these things, do you think that there's going to be some people reading it? I I'm think, thinking, hey, hold on a minute. That's my club he's talking yeah. about. Or I, that, That's me. that sounds very familiar yeah. to yeah. an incident that happened at my club. Or <laughs> <laughs> no, I think I think the characters of uh, that it's fiction, right? And uh, I created characters, and uh, the main character is actually the villain is the main character. Actually, I wanted to make the hero the main character, but while I was write, uh, writing. The villain was more interesting as an agent <laughs> and a bad guy. So even there, you see, mm, we yeah. were talking about bad agents. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Even in my book, I say, man, this bad agent is more interesting than the good <laughs> agent. I need to make him the main guy in this book. And yeah, the main agent is from Spain. He is coming from Spain <clears> and uh, he's trying to make a deal at Man United. So that's the story. Uh, that, that character doesn't exist. What factual really is there, or what is fact is, that there's this journalist, a female journalist called Annabelle, and she's from Wilmslow up in north next to Manchester, and she reveals things which happened in the past, or still going on with nepotism in football clubs, where, where someone, let's say um, uh, Alex Ferguson's son was an agent, right? Or the son was a football player or coach or whatever. So 
that's that's the relationship I'm showing like in a lot of other clubs which happened. I'm not saying it's illegal. It, it, it wasn't illegal. But is it ethically correct to open your own son the door as an agent and put him inside the club so he can sign players? Is it correct, like ethically mm. from a club perspective or from the FA perspective, should nepotism be allowed to do that? Because while he was giving his own son a professional contract, maybe someone else should have got it, right? We don't know. Yeah, yeah. Are you unfair to someone else being, being too fair or favor your own son, right? Mm. Or why are you helping your own son sign a play as an agent? Is it your job as a coach to, you know, push your son to someone else? Like, uh, push the players to an agent. And, uh, and there are many of these issues happening right now, today, in, to, in today's football. And that affects players, other agents, family members. And I'm thinking if that is uh, correct and it shouldn't be stay like that, I want the reader to understand our world. Because yeah. I'm writing from my world, which I've experienced the last 20 years, but in a fiction. I'm, I lie, actually, to tell the truth with other words, mm. right? I, yeah. I create characters which don't exist to explain the truth what's happening. And if that's correct like that, the reader should decide. Mm. And some people might say, hey, if I were a dad, I put my son there through too, right? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah. and I heard that like from many. Like if Zinedine Zidane puts his own son as a professional player at Real Madrid, but never played, right? In the end, couldn't make it. Yeah. Can't make it as well as somewhere else. So you would think, but wait a minute, he got a professional contract at Real Madrid. We're talking about the biggest club in the world. So, but he can't make it somewhere else as well. So that, that means maybe he wasn't good enough. So was it then okay to put him there? In the first place. And maybe it's, put, it's also bad for the kids, you know? It put pressure on them. Imagine your dad is Zinedine Zidane also. Yeah. How, how will you come to that level? Like, impossible. And you're There's only one, you know? Like, so, yeah, and it's uh, pressure as well on the kids as well like, uh, to put them there. So, mm. essentially, nepotism has act it probably ruined a lot of deals in football as well. Mm. And it's probably... Yeah, I mean, a lot of people... Imagine you work in a football club as a sporting director or a head of recruitment and your brother is a football agent and yeah. has some players. And you might it's be... It's a conflict, isn't it? It's yes. A conflict you, you, might be a little bit, yeah. you might be yeah. a little bit too close and say, may I send some players for my yeah. own brother's agencies? Yeah. Like. Or loan out players to your son's team or Yes, so on. which happened as well. Yeah, Which yeah, happened yeah, as yeah. well. And, and a lot of other things, like in other clubs, I think it was... Uh, I don't know which other club was it. I mean, it's in the book. I mean, we should tell everything, right? Yeah, we want yeah. them to read it. We want them to read it. We want to make it a bestseller so I yeah. can write another one and reveal more, right? I, yeah. I was going to say to you. Yeah, sorry. Sorry, sorry. No, 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 finish no. your. Uh, so what I'm saying is not, I'm not a whistleblower in terms of I'm bringing new knowledge or hidden knowledge. It's all in the public. Yeah. So what I've researched is what is there. So I watched the BBC documentary about nepotism in football with Alex Ferguson, yeah. for example. I watched... I read in The Guardian a lot of things about what really happened. So I'm more a journalist than uh, an agent, a lawyer, a writer in that sense. I do my research, the facts, I bring them all together, and then I build a story around it, yeah. a thriller. So that's what I've done. So I didn't uh, reveal something new. It's just there somewhere, but mm. people don't look much into it. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. As far as I know, I've never heard that, um, that done before, like a, a book about a football agent, and it's a thriller, right? And... As you've explained already and you've been spoken very eloquently, you're a very um, ambitious person. You're a person, you're multi-talented, right? Um, started off, as you said, you even you stuck to your guns with the lawyer stuff and that. I can see this being turned into a movie. Imagine that. <laughs> yeah? Imagine, would, that be, yeah. Would, would you like that? Would you like uh, to, I would, like, you, know, you know, this being a movie or a, do, or <laughs> a document, you know, well, not a documentary, you know, in docu-series yeah, on TV docu or yeah. something like I that. Mean, Could you see that with this book? I mean, it can, to be honest. Like, I, um, I'm working now on two books a year. So this was the March release. In September, my second one will come fiction. out. Again, fiction. Again, factual things in yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. And the second one is about, it's even more interesting, I think, than this one it will be. It's about human trafficking in football and human trafficking through football from Africa to Europe. Okay. So we have every year 15,000 African players, minors, ending up in Europe somewhere without anything. They just got tracked there here through human trafficking. Some people make money out of that. And everyone is looking away. Yeah. No one is how taking are you saying through football? Because so foot, football is a to... tool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, imagine you're a 17-year-old, 16-year-old player in Nigeria or Ghana, and someone has contacted you from England and says, hi, I'm agent uh, Marcus, and I'll bring you to uh, Manchester for a trial. 
and send some papers. Uh, but I need 5,000 euro for that or sterling to start the process. You take the money and says you need to buy a ticket. They buy a ticket, get the visa and everything. It's a lot of fake documents as well. And then they ended up in Europe somewhere at the airport or train station. No one is there. Oh, yeah? that's disgusting. That's and, it, and it happens a lot. And as, as well, there's uh, human trafficking through football. That means if someone want to leave the country, so they say, for example, okay, there's a football club interested in him. Let's give him a visa. But it isn't. They just want to get out of there. So there's yeah. two ways of tra uh, human trafficking. And especially with minors, it's very dangerous, like under 18 kids. You know, I met, I was in Kenya in December in Nairobi and I was teaching at law school there and one day I made like a get together with me I do wherever I go connect with Urquhart and there was one football player who came three hours by bus from somewhere out in Kenya just to meet me talk with me he got invited for trial invited from Werder Bremen in Germany but so I checked the document it looked very real you know even to me like when I looked like actually he said yeah I, I need to pay 3,000 euros and I need to pay the visa and everything he was explaining me the whole story and he said there's an agent in Scotland and one in Germany he works with them and then he showed me messages with them whatsapp messages and everything right it looks very like real so I, I said can I make a uh, picture or can you send me through whatsapp this uh, this document he sent it to me I sent it to Werder Bremen to someone I know I said can you check that like it looks not 100% but I'm not really sure yeah. like if you invited this boy or not and I said that's not us so again like it's it disgusting, happens, yeah, it? it happens everywhere. And that he explained me that he was collecting the money in the small village where they live from every neighbor. So it's for the, for the for small the village. That's for, massive for one person. Oh, yeah. To come if out that person goes, it's not will, it's not will look only after the, his own family. It will look after the whole community, yeah, yeah, the whole yeah. village. They all put their money into this boy. And imagine that boy arrives in Germany somewhere in Bremen, can't go back. How will he go back? Yeah, Everyone, he lost money and they start living illegal in these countries and trying to survive. With that money, they earn illegal. They're trying to help their families in Africa. And that's, wow. a, that's a research I'm now, I'm actually talking to someone from Nottingham Trent University who wrote a PhD in that case. Very interesting. He's a student from Nigeria, lives here. So I'm interviewing them, okay. making notes and doing research. I'm talking to an organization in Switzerland who is working against this human trafficking in football. So I'm interviewing them, I'm making notes. So I'm a journalist more, I'm a researcher. And when I have everything together, I start writing a thriller around it. It's fantastic. I'm looking forward to that. Where you get the time to do all this? Morning hours. <laughs> <laughs> Morning hours. I'm a, you know, I, I, I wrote this in the morning hours. So 5, 5.30, I wake up, I do this one and a half, two hours in the morning where I can really focus on writing and researching because there's no other way I can do it. Like when, when, when my son wakes up, now I have a second the one. I starts. just got a second son born four weeks ago, exactly. Oh, Congratulations. Wow. Thank you. And he was born when I was doing a deal at the same time in yeah. the hospital. 8th of February was the Turkish deadline day. Yeah, yeah. And one, one night before, I have a player, Sinan Gümüş. He was a Fenerbahce yeah, yeah, yeah. and he's a German Turk like Mesut. And he wanted to leave uh, in January because he was like, he was not in the squad anymore. Kind of a method similarity. Yeah. <laughs> I got always this problem. What are you doing to these players? Yeah, why, why, do, I, so do I attract them? It's, it's about me, actually. I'm the problem. So, and uh, one night before, like on the 7th of February, the deal was off. I talked to Fenerbahce, Antalya Sport, my player said, okay, well, we can't agree on the salary and everything else. The clubs couldn't agree. Say, okay, fair enough, deal is off. In the night, my wife starts, okay, I think the baby's coming. The morning hours, we're going to hospital, six o'clock in the morning or so, we're driving. <clears throat> my phone is ringing. So early, right? It never rings so early, my phone. Once, twice, and then it's red, you know, sitting at the lights, and then I'm waiting and I'm checking. Oh, the president of this club, the president of the other club, <laughs> and my player called all three parties, so you know? What's you know? Going on. And I'm like, and I look at my wife, and I look at my phone, you know? Can, can you wait a bit? Or? <laughs> and I'm like, okay, what to do now? And I'm trying to make a plan, right? So how, how will I tell her <laughs> that to do? So, we, so then I, I texted the guys and said, you guys, I'm, I'll call you back. I'm on the way to hospital, you know? So my second son is on the way. I'm with my wife. I'll call you when I'm there. So, and they said, yeah, yeah, we just have six or seven hours left. Because in Turkey, you know, three hours ahead, yeah, yeah. time-wise. Yeah. So until a certain time, the documents need to be with the Federation. And I'm like, oh my God, more pressure, right? <laughs> so I arrived. I said to my wife, Lucy, 
I think we have two we have two deals today. <laughs> she, looked at me like, she looked at me like, what do you mean? I think the deal is on again and we have six hours left. <laughs> and we were in this room, right? And this and, and the midwives were looking at me like this bad guy. Yeah. You know, like, you know, his wife is giving him you birth. He's an agent. <laughs> and he's an agent. And what a bad guy. And I'm like, I will manage it, don't worry. And I'm literally with one hand holding my wife <laughs> with the other on my phone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you, no, 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 we can't accept that. No, you need to still change that clothes. <laughs> she is, I had over 100 calls on and off with the lawyers, with the player, I have a lawyer on the ground. And it was like, wow. and I have this one photo of mine where my newborn son is here and I have still my phone. Oh my God. <laughs> like born. So they give it to me. My wife is there. Look, I'm holding my son and I'm still on the phone. <laughs> and I have a photo of that, right? And I was like, I said, wow, I think my, hopefully my wife will not divorce me after this <laughs> one, you know? You'll never and, forget that deal. Yeah. You'll never yeah, forget that. Yeah, that was, that was an amazing deal. Oh, yeah. congratulations. congratulations. Thank you congratulations. very much. Well, listen, right, we're going to be giving away a couple of copies of this book um deadline by um Urquhart Soga, right um and he's going to sign them as well he's going to sign yeah. them as well as you can already um you've heard the interview he's so engaging um it's I, I can't wait to read it you know what I mean you, just for some of the things you've explained I can't wait to read the sequel that you ain't even finished yeah, right yeah. yeah because you know what <laughs> even you just saying that just really opened my eyes you know I've had emails from um people in Africa okay. saying I'm a player can you help me? Can you help me? Yeah, they're desperate. Yeah, a lot. Of Honestly, them. and then we, so, so when you just said that, I was just like, wow. You know what I mean? Uh, it's so easy to see how those people can be taken advantage. Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. You know, it's, it's disgusting. Yeah. I can't wait to read the sequel, yeah. which is even out. But this book is out right now. We're going to give away two copies of this uh, for the. You know what? For the competition, um, this is what I'm going to do. Earlier on in the interview, Urquhart said he said he told us about the following that Mesut Ozil has on social media. He gave a figure. We're going to go with the figure that he gave us, right? If you know what that figure is, I want you to put that um, in the comments below and we're going to pick two people at random and they're going to win this book. Um, Deadline by Urquhart Sogut. Um, it's been fantastic to have you here. Thank um, you very much. I really thank you very much for. Being I should have come earlier. I should have come. Why? It was a nice. Was it? It was no, it's been yeah. absolutely brilliant. And yeah. you know what? Thank you for being so open and, um, you know, um, Where can they find you as well? Twitter and... I mean, I'm like, I have my website, erkutsogut.com. There's a lot mm -hmm. of information about me. They can yeah. find... Can they get a book there as well? Yes, there's a link to the book. Is, is yes. this book, is it uh, it's on Amazon. Amazon? It's on it? Amazon. Yeah. They can so we'll go put on, a link to that as yeah, well. Yeah, you can go on Amazon directly. And on my website, there's a, I write every week a blog about okay. the football world. And uh, so they can read about the blogs, about agents' work. If they're interested, there's a free book as well on my website. How to become a football agent the well, first I, edition yeah. my, my, my nephew get, yeah it's for free the pdf they can download there yeah. brilliant my nephew the other day said to me um he said unks i want to become a football agent okay cc so. goes, can you help me i said to me i said oh, <laughs> I, I can't help you but i said i do you know i know a couple of agents but i'll, I'll refer him to that yes. as well yeah more than i'll refer him to that as well yeah. um that's brilliant but um no listen best of luck with this thank book. you very much i'm thank really you. excited to read it and um thank you it, it, you know give our regards to mesit will do still still a he, sent you, he sent you some coffee as well. I, I, yeah, I, I yeah, left yeah. It up, yeah. So. Oh, well, we Messi appreciate it. That. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it's it's Messi's own coffee. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm, yeah. Taking yeah. I'm taking yeah. that. I'm taking that. We appreciate that. Yes. Is, he, is he still a gunner? He's still yard gunner's yard. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think he will know. You know, look at his stages where he played, the, the longer stage as Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's a gunner more than anything and else. You said, hold on. As well yeah, yeah. Hold on. I mean, you said earlier on that he was doing his badges. Is that what you said no, earlier? No, 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 not him, no, 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 not him. Oh, Arteta, no, no, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is it, yeah. Any thoughts of that for, yeah, very, for him, management or coaching or anything? Passing it honest, on? I don't think so. No? I, I, I don't think Mesut uh, would work in a football club in any capacity. I, I can't see it now. What do you see him Maybe. doing in the future then? So I think he'll humanitarian be, role yes, somewhere or something? Yes, yes. I think he's more like an ambassador and a face for big uh, social issues where he can work with the United Nations or... He could be uh, drive people into projects. He could attract people into these things. And I think I see him there like he, he loves working. Like we have this big shoe project for now nearly 10 years. We operating kids every month in another country with, with German doctors. And this is his biggest social impact program 
which is doing it a lot. We operate also with other players, like with Sinchenko, actually, the Ukrainian. Oh, okay, yeah. we, mm. we operated last summer in Ukraine, Mesut and Sinchenko wow. together. So Mesut is driving other players as well to do, let's do it together with Pogba in Africa, with Antonio Riedegger in Africa. So he's, he's doing a lot of projects yeah, no. and this is his main thing. So I even go sometimes to places. The last time I was in India and in Bangalore in the hospital. So it's a, he's a, basic and easy setup in terms of we know the doctors we know the money we know how much we spend there is no money going to a certain organization we don't know what's happening mm -hmm. and and we know exactly how many kids we operate and yeah and this is like south africa is every year very big for us and we've been nearly to every african country from cameroon to uganda so this is his things what he drives him to share and to change kids life in a positive way and i think he gets a lot of prayers i believe in prayers you know i believe if people pray for you, if you do good things, you get more and you got rewarded with good things in life and afterlife. And I think Mezzo got a lot of prayers in life and I think he will go on with that, yeah. which, which is good for him. Yeah, well, listen, good on Quite you, Mezzo Ozo. I think he's, he's definitely a blessed person. And um, like you said, he's, he's uh, somebody who's beyond football. And that's a great thing that, you know, when, you're, when your career finishes, it's just the uh, next chapter beginning of something even greater sometimes mm -hmm. and i think that's what's going to be the case with mesut ozil yeah Urquhart, thank you very much for coming today no, and once you. again deadline by Urquhart soka cannot wait to read it get hold of this book we're going to put a link in the description for the amazon link as well and for, um, for Urquhart's website where you can get this book um available right now um Turkish, thank you very much as well. It's been brilliant. I've it loved has, this. It has. No, I appreciate it. Yeah, no, I, re I really liked it as well. And it was a good conversation. It was good talk. And I really enjoyed it. You know, yeah. otherwise, if I wouldn't, I would tell you. Like, But it was really nice. Thank you for, thank you for having me. I mean, I'm, I'm your... You're no, the host pleasure, and your guest here, so... When the next oh, book comes you. out, let us know, because that one sounds yeah. like an interesting yeah. one as yeah. well. Yeah, yeah you've got to be back for the next book, definitely. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, I and can. And let us know we're not that bad, yeah? Thank you very much. Shop for AFTV merch at shop.aftv.co.uk. Subscribe to us on YouTube. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, Snapchat and Twitch. We've got content for every platform, so check it out.